Welcome to today's episode of Financial Fluency. Today I'm here with Sheila Hurd, who is a retired Army veteran and the founder of My Life, My Terms movement. Hi, Sheila. How are you doing? Hi, how are you? I'm doing very well. I'm excited to have you on the show. Awesome. I'm glad to be here. Well, can you tell me the story of how you went from being in the Army to founding this movement that you're running now? Well, when I, um, well, when I retired from the Army, I wasn't planning on retiring at the time, but my daughter had gotten sick. Um, at first, she was losing her eyesight, and then later on, she was losing mobility in her arms and legs. And so then a year after that, my son was diagnosed with a mental illness. And then a year after that, my oldest son died. And my son with mental illness was charged with, with this murder. Oh my gosh. I did not know this backstory before we started talking. That that is a lot. I have two kids with special needs myself, so I understand some of this, but um, that, that is a lot of things to happen within a short period of time. Yes, because my, um, it took me a while to get the help for my daughter before my son got his diagnosis, and I ended up having had to retire from the military, and I wasn't able to work for a whole year because she couldn't do anything but turn her head left and right. So I had already had some um, degrees and stuff behind my name. So after that year was up and I had to do something because my funds had ran low. And the only thing I could find was a minimum wage paying job. So I said, with all my credentials and with all my experience, so that is what prompted me to start my own business. And so... Oh. What was your daughter's diagnosis or her condition? She has neuromyelitis optica. It's in the multiple sclerosis family, but it's an antigen that separates it. It attacks her brain and spinal cord. Okay. Is it degenerative? Yes. How is she doing today? She's doing fine. Um, she has some mobility in her arms and legs now, but she's next month, she is looking to have surgery to help her to get some mobility in that hip because where it's cartilage at is turned to bone. So she can hopefully start to, she can stand up with a walker, but her walking is so hindered because of that hip. So they're gonna do surgery on that next month. Okay. So hopefully, you know, that'll work for her. And then your son with mental illness, what was he diagnosed with? Paranoid schizophrenia. Okay. Do you feel up to telling the story about your oldest son's death? Yes. Um, well, before his death, um, I had signed papers to have him committed. And it was a court order because he was with somebody else he didn't know when the, the car the person was driving was stolen. So I had to get a lawyer and he had worked it out, you know, because I had told them before he's able to come home, I wanted him to go get treatment, but they didn't pick him up. So this incident had happened. And the same night that my son died, he went to jail. And he was out eight months later. I didn't even know they had let him out because I had already told him I don't want him to come home until he get treatment because the incident happened at my home in my daughter's room the one who can't see and have limited use of her arms and legs. Cause I didn't know how he would react. And I got a phone call and they was telling me that, did you know that Chris was getting out today? I said, no, have nobody called me and told me nothing. So I called to the jailhouse. He was already out. So I had to go and find him. So, you know, when I got him home and he, he reacted fine. He was kind of, you know, enclosed. And he still is to a certain extent, but he's a lot better today because I signed the papers again to have him picked up again. And this time they picked him up. It took two weeks, but they, they picked him up and he's, he's coping. He's coping. He's, he's doing well. But the, one of the major things that he faced right now is the fact that he has a felony on his record when he don't have a felony because he wasn't indicted. And not, he cannot get a job. And he had a job, and that's how he lost his job. But they ended up taking it off his record because 
is not valid, but they didn't give him his job back either. So he, he he's going through that, but he's he's smiling and you know, he still got to deal with the situation that he's really not dealing with though. But I'm I'm just I'm amazed at where he is right now as, as well as my daughter. You know, for say spirit wise, I mean I I'm amazed. I am I am amazed. Because, you know, that's why I use living my life in my terms because I guess, you know, part of me kind of spilled over to them a little bit because, you know, no matter what it is that you face in life, it's not about the challenge that you're facing. It's about what you tell yourself at that very moment when the incident happened because the night when they told me that my son had died, I still had my daughter. And then his daughter was at my house at the time. And, you know, he wasn't in his right mind. He had got the keys and left in the car, so the police had to go find him. So I had to worry about them shooting him when they found him, because they already knew of his situation. Mm-hmm. So it all worked out because, you know, I just, you something, for me, when stuff comes up and I know I cannot do anything about it, I just pray and give it to God and just watch it unfold. So I, I can't complain. I can't be mad. I mean, I love my son. I miss him. I do. I have my moments. When I do, I just cry and do what I need to do and just go on about my business. So was the son with mental illness directly responsible for his brother's death? Well, they ended up um, fighting because that same week, my son that died, his friend was shot and died. And I was told that the same one that shot him was looking for him. So I don't really know the whole situation on all that. But somebody else had gave him the gun. And him and my other son had got the fighting and the gun went off. And so I don't, well, I I didn't allow guns in my house because you couldn't have no weapons in my house with my son. I had to even have my knife. But I tell him all the time, I'm so upset with you for having that gun in my house. But, you know, he's gone. So... Wow, that is that is so much to deal with. Yes, but you know, is you know, I don't know if that's you know from training that I have got in the military. No matter what situation that you're facing, you know, you just you got to do what's next, and that's what I have trained myself to do even before my son had died. You know, no matter what it is, because I was a single parent because I had got divorced, raising my kids on my own. So that's just, okay, what, what is the problem right here, right now? What I need to do to fix it? Mm-hmm. Because it's not going to do me any good to cry over, to stew over. It's, it's not going to benefit me or anybody else. Because right now, I got to be strong for my daughter, and I got to be strong for my son. And the reason I say because it's amazing because she smiles, he smiles, and they play and have fun. Now, she's been down ever since she was 19 because she first got she was having a problem with her eyes. She had just graduated high school. And after her senior year in high school, she had um, acid reflux real bad. And then I said, no, something is not right. But, you know, it be, it be on your mind, but you don't say anything about it. I don't know what happened. And um, later on, you know, she kept on complaining about it. I said, well, what's going on? Can you hear me? Um, something's gone a bit wrong. We can edit this part out. Okay. Are you still there? I'm trying to. Can you edit? Okay. Something had came in, and um, it was a senior year, and I'm like, something is wrong. It just has something to be in your in the back of your mind. Something's not right because she shouldn't be having acid reflux this bad where she has to be out of school for two months. Mm-hmm. She got better and she graduated high school. And then it came back again when she she just started college. It was her first week in college. And I found out about the eyesight. And then so the doc had then we had to end up taking her to the neurologist and he said it's going to get worse. And it did. It seemed like that was in January and by February she was just totally down. She couldn't do them to turn her head left or right. Wow. So I see that you help people with, with resilience and with um choosing happiness and life and freedom and to be able to do that in the face of all of these things you've dealt with is remarkable yes because one thing that i have learned that i strive is that it's all about the choices that i make because i have realized for myself at that pivotal moment when things are at its worst 
is very important at that moment of what I tell myself because that's what I'm going to move forward with. If it's in a negative way, then that's how I'm going to respond. But if it's in a positive way, that's how I'm going to respond. How do you? I just, I just choose the positive. I think that's hard for a lot of people. Yes, it is. It's a process, and it's not an overnight process. I mean, I, you know, I have endured a lot, but and I, I want what's best for me, no matter what. Mm-hmm. That's just what I choose. Mm-hmm. Well, I know for myself, having special needs kids too, that was the reason I left the traditional workforce as well, is mm-hmm. my daughter, she was born with a white blood cell disorder. She needs tube feeding. She has autism as well and speech difficulties and eyesight problems. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't, she needed more care than I could do by working a traditional job every day. Do you work with that population with women who've sort of been forced to leave like you and I both were? Yes. I mean, I offer, I offer it, but you know, with some of the mindsets of people now, they don't know what to accept, when to accept, or even how to accept. Mm-hmm. It's just, so right now I'm just really working on trying to get you to awareness, to look at why you are where you are right now. Mm-hmm. So for me, to me, that's the biggest thing. You got to shift that mindset. So you know, that's why I'm working with them now. First, dealing with you first. Because one of the trainings that I went through was about dealing with me first. Because once I can deal with me, now I can deal with you. Mm-hmm. And with your children, too, if you have children yeah. who need extra care. Yeah. yeah. So how did, did being in the military help you defi- develop that mindset? Or was it training afterwards? Well, I must say it was... Well, I had really developed that first in my childhood. Because I remember I almost failed the fifth grade because I because people are always talking, they were, I'm not doing anything, and I almost failed the fifth grade. But I always I used to always be unroll. So after I almost failed the fifth grade, I said, you well, know, this is my life. I got to be responsible for it. If don't nobody else love me, I love me. If don't nobody else care about my life, I care. And then, you know, as years went by, I got married and I was in my bed sleep and I was like, I'm married to this man and I feel like this. And I said, um, never ever in life will I ever lose Sheila, no matter what happened. And I just added those things on, you know, as I went on in life. And I did learn some tools and techniques from the military as well, as far as, you know, how to persevere and how to be resilient, because no matter what happened, you got to finish the mission <laughs> and keep on going. And so that just goes with the different things that I have applied to my life and it has worked for me. When you were in the military, I know you said that you were a single mom. Did you ever have to serve far away or were you serving? Yes, I, um, at the time when I went to Iraq, I went to the war in Iraq. Um, I had a husband at that time. Okay. But I ended up getting divorced when I came back though. So since then, since being in Iraq, have you been able to live in the same place with your children while you were working still until your daughter came down with this illness? Yes. Well, when she first got sick, I, you know, I always had my home, but I was stationed somewhere else. I was going back and forth and she was with me at the duty station where I was at the time. Okay. Well, we came back home. Does the military have good support for when your children are ill? Um, I'm retired now. So no, it where they were supposed to be able to stay on my dear's program, but for some reason it wasn't working out right because at the time she needed some medication right then and all the insurance was seemed to be arguing with each other. So I had to take her off mine. My husband had to take her off his and just let Medicaid just go ahead and pay for it because she needed the medication right then because she was starting to see me. Mm-hmm. Well, she was, was she 19 at that point, you said? Yes. Okay, so that makes sense too. Yeah, I had the same experience with my daughter. My daughter was diagnosed in 2010 before Obamacare came in and our, you know, we're self-employed. So we had crappy uh, individual family policy and it had an autism exclusion. So until they really figured out everything going on, out with, on with her, with her white blood cell disorder, eventually she got her own insurance on Medicaid and that was the best possible thing. I mean, yes. I don't deal with any of it anymore now that she's on has her own Medicaid policy. Before that, it was all the insurance arguing with each other and 
yeah, it was pretty difficult. So personally, I love Medicaid. I think it's great. <laughs> Stay great. <laughs> Me too. I know. It's a danger right now. There's so much. Because I have two. Because my other son, his medicine, he has to have every month. And my daughter, hers is sky high every six months. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's knock on wood for Medicaid keep taking care of our children who need it so much. Yeah. Well, yeah. definitely. So for the people that you work with, can you tell me some about them? What, what kind of people do you end up working with? Well, I really work with um, all kinds because I'm, I'm trained to, it doesn't matter what the challenge is, there's a solution for it. But, you know, I've been dealing with people just like with my son, with his self. I have been dealing with people with grief. You know, they asked me to do a thing, and I did that, and, and currently I'm working with Mamie as the president to help come up with resources for, you know, with people with mental illness. You know, I try to help, you know, you know, single women with kids to try to come up with a plan for them to have more income coming in. I mean, it, it's just different things because the, this is my life. This is what I have conquered and, and, and endured and overcome in my life. Mm hmm and so I'm also, too, trying to work with soldiers as well to help them to find that balance, mostly really balance. Mm -hmm. The free thing in life is going to come about having that balance in your life, all areas. Because when, it, when one area is affected, it's going to throw one of the other areas off sooner or later. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can stop it when you find out what is that problem, what is that one thing that, that got you off track. It could mm -hmm. be finances, it could be health. But it, it's a process to it. Because the mm -hmm. process, have, it, it could be, it's of the same system, but you're going to have to pick, choose a process that's going to work for you. Mm -hmm. I hear that. I often feel like I can focus really well on one thing and then something else falls apart. Like with my, with my daughter, there was a period of time where we really got her program together. We got people supporting her, working with her. Everything was great my husband and my health really deteriorated. <laughs> you know, we were so focused on that. And then for a while I focused on health and then financial stuff started getting difficult. Do, do you find that with people? Like you, you can okay. I have trouble focusing on it all at the same time, keeping it all, yes. keeping all the balls in the air. <laughs> yes, the emotional trauma queen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. So what kind of um, techniques do you use to help people? Well, it's a, um, it's a blueprint that I have, which is the foundation for a person. It's, it's five steps. It helps to diagnose you, to help you to learn how to condition yourself, learn how to leverage, learn how to deal with, with that massive pain and get massive pleasure and get you to um, look at, um, you know, just think about when you're on a basketball court and you have to have a coach. You can't see everything. You have to listen to the coach. And see, that just to give you empowering alternatives and then to look at your peer group. Who mm -hmm. is it that you want to be like? Who is it you want to become? And what is it that they're doing? And what can you do to have that life that you want? See, that's the foundation right there. And see, then once you get that foundation, see, it's going to affect your emotions and your behaviors. I like that basketball court analogy. Yeah. This is true. Like, each person on the court has a different function, and they support each other. And when they work together then you can score. But if just one person has the ball all the time and won't give it up, then uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to win, right? Yes. And it's yes. true, the coach can see, you know, you're focused on your opponent right in front of you, but you can't see what the guys behind you are doing. Like someone may be really slacking off and you could get the ball to somebody. <laughs> Maybe I'm taking it too far, but I was like, yeah, yeah that's true. It, when you're playing, you're just focused right here. You don't see what everyone else is doing. Yeah, you need that 360 view of your whole life. Mm -hmm. And then from that moment, you know, that if you pay attention, this is the emotion that you, de de you, you deal with, and this is the behavior that you're getting from that. And this is how you meet your needs. You, you, everybody want to be significant. Everybody want to have security. Everybody want love and connection. And everybody want variety. But based on your, your foundation and how you get your emotions and your behavior, this is how you're going to be, this is how you're going to meet your needs whether it be positive or negative. The mm -hmm. choice is and then look at your life right now. Or are you getting results that you want? It all is going to stem from you having this foundation. Mm -hmm. So do people usually come to you when they have had some major trauma in life? 
Oh yes, I have had um I had one soldier who was suicidal and um and a lot a few, you know, that have had deaths because they have had children who were um shot. So I, I have dealt with some of those as well and I have <laughs> dealt with um well actually I'm doing a workshop tomorrow on work life balance. It's just Trauma is just my thing. I know, you know, I just, because I'm, I'm a strategist. <laughs> that's my brand, spiritual balance and mindset strategy. And, and that's what I do. Well, I do think sometimes the rest of us in the civilian population, it's hard to really appreciate what soldiers go through. I mean, other than movies, most of us have not been there. Most of us have not had someone fall in front of us, you know, a, a friend, a colleague, a companion. It's hard to even imagine the real life of that for a lot of us. Yes, because I know when uh, we were over there, we lost one. They ran over a line, a landmine, and it was four people in the vehicle, but this person, the one that died, he took out the impact. But, you know, that was one too many, and then it was some soldiers that had went out and came back and, you know, gave us we looked at some pictures that they had and I'm usually very strong, but I look at those pictures and tears start coming out of my eyes to just see what actually really happens to a human body. Yeah. I mean, that seems like such an important population to work with. And I know historically has not gotten enough support. I mean, just looking at suicide rates coming back, employment rates coming back. Mm -hmm. Homelessness. Yes. Yeah. What do you think of all that? What what needs to happen to make that better over here when, when people come home? I believe that the funds are there, but, you know, they, they're just not where they need to be. Because when I went to Iraq, um, there were a lot of funds that were used, a lot of funds that was wasted that would have been better used elsewhere. So I just really think if they just really look at really what they're spending the funds on is there. Yeah. What about for the rest of us who want to support people who come? I mean, you guys don't get that much choice in where you go necessarily or what you do. It depends on the administration. It depends on the political climate. But I think I, there are things that the rest of us can do, aren't there? Yes, well, I know in my community where I live at, um, if there's resources out there, it's not well known. Because I know for a lot of soldiers, in, including myself, it's hard trying to find out what the resources are and where to find them. That I have talked with other soldiers and they have experienced the same thing. So as far as a civilian trying to do something to help, it's kind of hard when the actual entity itself is not providing soldiers with what's necessary. Hmm. Okay. Well, it sounds like you're doing work to try to help the soldiers as well as other people experiencing family trauma. Yes. Yes. Cause you know, it, it, it's hard on families as well, not just the soldiers. Yeah. Cause it's like when we came back, while we was over there, we lost one. But it seemed like when we came back to the stateside, we lost more. You know, the accidents, um, car accidents. Um, I can't remember. I think somebody had committed suicide, but I'm not for sure. But we had more deaths after we came back than when we was in country. Wow. That's a worrying statistic. Yes, it is. But, you know, we just, like I said, you just take the good with the bad because what I always say, Pain is unavoidable, but suffering is a choice. I mean, we got to move on because one thing about it, tomorrow is going to come regardless. Hmm. So if someone's listening to this and is in pain and is have, struggling and they think, you know, I, I hear Sheila's voice. I think this is someone I could talk to, someone I could get connect with, get help from. How can they connect with you and, and what can you do to help them? Um, they can contact me at um, herdsheila90 at gmail.com. That's H-E-A-R-D-S-H-E-L-I-A-90 at gmail.com. Okay. And also, too, they can um, call me at 662-205-5964. And 
And what I do is um, I give I give um, free sessions to people to see where they are in their life right now. They are ready to take the next step because a lot of times in life, if you're not ready, there is nothing that I, I or anybody else can do for you if you're not ready to move forward. And you know, this sometimes, you know, you just have to become come into awareness of where you are right now. It's a requirement for you to do things at that moment because you got to realize your situation must change. You must change it and it must change now. If you don't do anything different, it's not going to change for you. That's why you have to be ready to move forward. It, it could be a slow pace. It doesn't matter, just one little small step. But it's going to, you're going to have to be ready to make that leap. How do people know when they're ready? Well, a lot of times when you get sick and tired and sick and tired, and for some people, it could be very detrimental for them if they don't do something different. Say, for instance, you got a, a, a mother who has a child, and you got to do a certain thing to get your child back. You got to do something different. You're not, you can't do the same thing. Or say, for instance, um, you're not doing anything with your life and you don't have anywhere to stay. So guess what? You're going to have to get a job. It's always hard when you have nowhere to stay, <laughs> filling out the forms, putting an address, you know, a shelter. Uh... So see, you're going to have to start somewhere, no matter how small it is. It might just come into awareness that, man, I need to get a job. You're going to have to start somewhere. No matter how small it is, it, that doesn't matter. As long as you are willing to go forward. Okay, well, that sounds good. Is, is there anything else that you want to say before we wrap up? Um, life, life, is a, life is about you. It's about the choices that you make and the consequences behind them. You've got to take responsibility for you, no matter what. Never, ever give up on you. That's never an option. That's a great, a great way to end. Thank you so much, Sheila. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you. And we'll, be sure, to, we'll be sure to put some links to your website and how people can contact you in the show notes as well. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sheila.